Hello and welcome to First Talk with Violet Gonda. Today we are going to dissect the newly appointed cabinet, uh, the cabinet that was appointed by President Robert Mugabe yesterday. And our guests this evening are former Education Minister David Coltart, economist Vince Musewe, and here in the studio we have Trevor Maisiri, a senior analyst with the International Crisis Group. Welcome on the program, gentlemen. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Bea. Hi, Trevor. Hi, David. Hi, Trevor and, and, and Violet. Good to be with you. Thank you. So let me start uh, with uh, David. First of all, can you give us your reaction uh, to this new cabinet? Well, I'm not surprised by it. It's what I expected. Uh, a leopard doesn't change its spots. It, it's a very similar cabinet to all the cabinets that Robert Mugabe has, has chosen in the 33 years of, of his rule. Uh, so to that extent, it doesn't surprise me. I am concerned by a couple of aspects of it, um, mainly uh, the way I, I, I feel it, it actually abuses the spirit of the new constitution in two respects. Uh, the one is that the new constitution is very strong on the need for gender balance. Uh, section 17 of the, the constitution says that all state institutions need to ensure that genders are equally represented. And then in the specific clause of 104, uh, 104 subsection 4, it says the, the president in appointing ministers must be guided by consider considerations of regional and gender balance. There are only three women in this cabinet of, of uh, 26, um, which goes against both, both those laws. And then secondly, um, chapter 14 of the constitution uh, says that there must be devolution of power and there's a whole new structure of government set up with provincial councils, elected provincial councils, and elected chairperson. And yet, uh, despite that, he's gone ahead with appointing a sort of rerun of the old governor's resident ministers, which goes completely against the spirit of Chapter 14 and is going to be very ex expensive because it will lead to duplication. So those are my my principal concern. So, uh, um, David, uh, still on you, there are only four uh, women out of 26 uh, ministries. So how many should they have been? Is it 50-50? Well, if you look at Section 17 of, of the Constitution, it, it's, it talks about gender equality, which, which means 50-50, yes, absolutely. Um, now, Section 17, I must stress, doesn't oblige the, the president to ensure that there's 50 percent in cabinet. It doesn't say that because it talks about uh, all institutions and agencies of government. It talks about the membership of appointed governmental bodies. Now, those are obviously different to the cabinet, but there's a principle there that uh, what the Constitution seeks to achieve is gender equality in all commissions, all government boards, uh, and naturally, one would assume that you want to lead by example and you want to have a cabinet that sets that, that example. And also, you need women in cabinet who can lobby for and identify the, the best women to be appointed to these commissions. So mm. it, it goes against that spirit. So, Vince, your reaction to the well, new cabinet? Yeah, you know, the funny thing is about, you know, things never change. We've got a, a largely a team of people who led us into the 2008-2009 problem. You know, that's my main worry, that, you know, it's the same team. Who's going to put money on an old team that has clearly shown that they've lost in the past? And clearly, you know, I call it, you know, shifting, you know, shifting seats or chairs on the Titanic, where people have just been moved around. And um, if we look, for example, you know, I said, what are the critical kind of ministries? Right now it's financial. Okay, we've got a lawyer there, but is he going to account for all the time and revenue? That has been all the problem. Is he going to, you know, stop the government from unnecessary expenditure so that we can spend money in priority areas? If we look at indigenization, fair enough, Xavier Kasukure is not there. He was making a lot of noises unnecessarily. We've got someone else 
But remember, indigenization is Mugabe's baby. So he's not going to give it to someone who's got a, an independent mind. Mm. Let's look at agriculture. Made has been there with a food crisis. Look at Ignatius Chombo. Problems in local government with interference. It's a sad day for us. But you know what, the violence? I don't expect any better. You know, I'm not surprised at all. And, and that's my view. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to the issue of uh, the individuals dissecting, you know, the quality or the kind of ministers that we have in the, especially in the key ministries. But just to go to Trevor Maisiri, um, many people uh, thought that um, since this is said to be Mugabe's last uh, term, uh, who knows if it will ever happen, but uh, many people were thinking that this will be the time for him to actually redeem himself and uh, bring in people who will resuscitate the economy. So what's your take on what's happened now? Yeah, I mean, we, we all expected uh, that Mugabe would um, um, uh, take a, a, a new twist and uh, be able to bring in a cabinet that is very much focused on uh, economic revival. Um, and uh, an economic turnaround. But uh, what you see is, uh, for me, uh, the challenge is the structural nature of, uh, of, of this cabinet. Firstly, uh, you realize that uh, Mugabe has killed off the Minister of Investments promotion, which I think is a key necessity for a country that is looking at economic recovery. Um, uh, it's going to be very difficult to collapse investments uh, then uh, promotions within the Minister of Finance or any other ministry for that matter. Uh, this needed to be a standalone ministry uh, focused on uh, spending much time out there uh, uh, attracting uh, investments, um, uh, not just foreign direct investment, but also with a large diaspora population that, that may want to invest in Zimbabwe. Uh, we've got a very large uh, African population that also wants to invest into Zimbabwe. So I think that that is a major uh, issue of challenge in terms of economic recovery. Um, then you also look at the issue of um, uh, uh, the, 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 the personnel. I think our expectation was that uh, Mugabe needed to boost uh, the confidence level of the business, domestic business community uh, by ensuring that uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, economy-related ministries uh, would uh, find space in accommodating people from industry. For example, he tried to do that with the 2000 uh, uh, cabinet, which I think brought some level of uh, uh, confidence from the business community. But by retaining those ministries to uh, people of uh, political uh, loyalty, uh, I think it also deflates the confidence that business is looking for in terms of engaging uh, with government uh, uh, for economic recovery. Mm, some people are describing it as a war economy cabinet and others are saying that Mugabe has just basically stuffed his relatives in the key ministries. What can you say about this? Yeah, I mean, the, the issue of it being a war economy cabinet uh, is um, uh, an absent uh, 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 issue for me, I mean, in, in that regard. Um, uh, for example, look, uh, without really wanting to, 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 to look at the personalities and personalizing issues, but um, I think someone like Vince mentioned, uh, by having uh, uh, Chinamasa uh, in, uh, in, uh, in finance, um, you, you ask yourself the question, what leverage does Chinamasa have in terms of being able to uh, engage multilateral institutions to restructure Zimbabwe? With debt, which I know is a very topical issue. Uh, what leverage does Shinamasa have in terms of being able to um, engage with uh, humanitarian aid um, uh, donors, whom we know some of them have really been um, uh, helpful in the Zimbabwean context? Uh, you ask yourself, uh, what leverage does Shinamasa also have in terms of uh, uh, engaging um, uh, investors outside of the country, both foreign and uh, uh, domestic in the diaspora? Uh, you, you, you tend to see Shinamasa more from a political angle than you see him from an economic angle. Uh, therefore, the war nature of this cabinet in terms of the economy for me is quite absent. And the relatives? The relatives, yeah, they, they, they are quite there. You look at, uh, I think Mike Bima is related to the First Lady. Uh, you also look at uh, the World Ashidakwa is related to the President himself. But I think I don't want to judge them in the nature of their relations to either the President or whoever else. But I think uh, for me, um, uh, World Ashidakwa comes from the business sector. I, I expect him to, 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 to at least do bring in some uh, level of um, uh, 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 soberness in the mining industry. Uh, I think it's got the nature, it's got the capacity. Uh, but also what it relates to is that uh, Walter Shidakwa's relationship with uh, the president may ensure that uh, the president himself is also directly involved in the mining industry. Uh, you look at Mike Bima in, in industry, I think he's also got quite a record in terms of uh, his own business acumen. Uh, so I would not also want to judge him in terms of his personal relations, but also just uphold the basic background of him having been in business uh, to be able to run industry and commerce. Mm. So those would be
will be my comments in terms of those uh, regards. Mm. And uh, David, in terms of uh, the different factions in Zanu PF, with what you have seen so far with this uh, new uh, cabinet, which faction won? Well, it seems to me that uh, uh, Vice President Joyce Majuru has held sway here um, because uh, a number of those who were not uh, seemingly aligned to her, certainly in the last four years, have effectively been uh, demoted. Uh, Emerson Manangagwa was in the very powerful position of defence, and although justice and legal affairs is a very important ministry, still a very senior ministry, it doesn't have the same political power as defence has, and it separates them from the general. Um, Perhaps the person who's got the biggest emotion is Obert Mpofu. Uh, he goes from the very lucrative mines ministry to transport. Um, uh, and, and there's no doubt that that is, is a demotion. Mines is one of the principal uh, generators of, of wealth in, in the country. It's the key component of our economy. Um, Why do and, you think he has been demoted? Surely... He did well in the in this ministry, in the mines ministry, in terms of uh, you know the Zanu PF uh, line. Well, I think he did very well for himself. I'm not sure that he did that well for the country, uh, and possibly not uh, that well for for even the party. Uh, but uh, I'm simply speculating. But the the, the other person, of course, is Xavier Kasukuweri, uh, who has gone from the, the very important indigenization of youth ministry uh, to, to water and, and environment. Um, and and that's, that's quite a curious uh, demotion, given that indigenization really was the centerpiece of zanu PF's manifesto and policy. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's surprising that this uh, young Turk has, has been demoted in, in this way, and Francis Nema put in his place. Vince, what do you uh, make of that in terms of the factions in Zanu PF? Which faction do you think uh, has won in this case? Well, you know, uh, uh, you know it, it, although we must not use that to predict the future, because politics is very, it's a very, you know, shifty game. I kind of agree with David on the issue that, you know, it looks like uh, the Majuru kind of uh, faction seems to have more presence in the in the cabinet, which will not be a bad thing, really, you know, going forward. But it, it all depends, you know, on the next year or so, what is going to happen. Violet, my view is that, you see, there is a culture within ZANU. I say that if you're in a pool, you cannot claim that you are dry. There is a culture of how things are managed. And for me, regardless of what ministry one takes, you are, oh, you are more guided by, by, by the policies and ideas of the policy bureau than of what is needed on the ground. I mean, Trevor, they spoke about the issue of bringing people from the private sector. You get swallowed in that, in that animal, mm. and you actually become incompetent in some of the policies that you used to articulate before you joined. I mean, look at Nguni, who was you know, quite a prominent business person and, 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 and is now involved in this whole scenario. The fundamental issue we have to accept is that politics in Zimbabwe has not delivered, right? So as long as we, you know, continue to, you know, to hope that things will change, they will not change. That is my view, you know, we, we, we having this analysis and whatever, looking at personalities, but they're stuck in this beast. This beast is irrelevant. It has not delivered. It cannot make future decisions to guide this country forward, right? And that is what, in Zimbabwe, we have to worry about, to say, what are we going to do about that? Right. And Trevor, why didn't he announce a second vice president? Yeah, look, it, it looks like uh, the issue in ZANU-PF is that uh, 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 this issue needs to go to, to Congress. Um, and uh, we know they have an elective Congress, I'm sure it's by end of uh, end of this year. So what you realize is that uh, the person who has really been touted as the most probable vice president, uh, Simon Kayamoyo, 
he has been given a, a, a very philosophical ministry, the, um, which is senior minister uh, in the president's office without portfolio. I think for me that's just a holding cell uh, to, to keep him there until the end of the year before Congress then uh, uh, ensures that he assumes the vice presidency. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a procedural matter rather than it is a substantial matter. Mm. Mm. And um, obviously we now know that the defense, the former defense minister, Emerson Mnangagwa, is now going to be the justice minister and Sydney Sekiramai is going to take over uh, this ministry what do you make of that yeah look it's a uh, if, if you look at the, the 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 issue that David spoke about earlier the issue of uh, uh, constitutional provisions I think already from day one there are two issues in the Constitution that this cabinet appointment is defied the first one is the issue of uh, uh, dev de devolution where now you have seen the very governors that uh, were excluded in the constitution coming through the back door this time around as ministers of state for a province. Uh, and you also want to imagine that we also uh, will have provincial um, uh, councils uh, and metropolitan councils. You ask yourself the question, how are these ministers going to interact with those provisional councils and metropolitan councils? Are the metropolitan councils going to have the say and the sway of what happens in their provinces or it's going to be these ministers? So you, you, you see a defeat or a defeatist approach to the issue of uh, devolution that was in the constitution. The second issue that David also mentioned is the issue of um, gender representation. Three women out of 26, I think four. for me, is that four, it, women. four, four women sorry, yeah. out of 26 mm. is, uh, is, is, is deplorable for a constitution that uh, we all thought had empowered women to a particular level. So if you look at the tone that has been set by this uh, uh, cabinet appointment, it's a tone that tells you of the defiance of the constitution that we are likely to see going ahead. Therefore, by putting Munangagwa in the Minister of uh, Justice, it ensures that ZANU-PF can go back to the old days where they can amend the constitution uh, 19 times or less or even more this time around to be able to bring in clauses that they ins will ensure uh, of their preference rather than the preference of what the constitution is all about. Uh, so that is the role that Mnangagwa is going to play in the Minister of Justice. But however, that role seems to save the interests of the party rather than Mnangagwa's own interest in succession. Because if you are taken away from the holes of corridors of power of the military or anything that brings you close to the military within ZANU-PF, then you are away from the halls of corridors of power. So, so where does that put Sydney Sekeramai This now? then brings in Sydney Sekeramai back into the fold. Remember, I mean, some of us have been saying the issue of succession in ZANU-PF is not just a Munangagwa Mujuru issue. They are also what we have called spring-up candidates or the, the dark horses. And I think this only makes uh, the dark horse Sekeramai even more darker uh, by bringing him into the Minister of Defense. Mm. Do you agree, David? Because um, just talking Talking to some uh, people who were in the cabinet, you know, some MDC uh, former ministers, they say that uh, they actually had some respect for Sidney Segaramai and they said that uh, he didn't used to talk a lot in cabinet, but when he did talk, uh, people listened. Is this, was that the case? Did you see it that way when you were in cabinet? Yeah, there's no doubt that he, he was more moderately inclined than, than some of the... Uh, of the others. Uh, he was very balanced in his view. I found as, as Minister of Education that he was, he was very supportive uh, of, of me. And so he's definitely not in that, that uh, camp of, of hardliners. But he is a dark horse. He's a very quiet man. He keeps his views to himself. Uh, but when he did speak, he, he spoke sensibly. But do you think he's the right man for that uh, ministry, the Defence Ministry? Well, uh, is, is any person the right person? You know, when you have people who have come to power through such fraudulent means, uh, it doesn't matter how competent an individual is, you know, the, the bottom line in all of this is this, is this fundamental illegality. Uh, in the context of, of those available to, to ZANU-PF, within the ZANU-PF pool, yes, he's a sober head, um, you know, he's not going to do anything rash, and to, to that extent, uh, you know, I'm fairly comfortable having him in defense. Hello, did you say you feel comfortable having him? I'm fairly comfortable in that context. If, you know, if, if we are resigned to the fact that we've got uh, an illegal government, um, you know, which has come to power through fraudulent means, uh, within that context, yes. He, he's a, a, a sane, rational head, 
and he's not going to do anything irrational as defense minister. Mm, and Vince, let's now look at, uh, well, in depth at the, you know, various uh, ministers, new ministers that we have. And as an economist, let's start with uh, the finance minister, uh, Patrick Chinamasa. What will he have to do to turn things around? Yeah. Okay, as we know, violence, Zimbabwe's revenue base is low anyway, so the issue of tax revenue increasing before we have a decent investment climate is, a, is, is really not going to come up, uh, across. Right? The second thing is uh, maximizing the, the mining revenues, which have contributed significantly to, to the fiscus in the last couple of years. Uh, there have been issues of transparency. Uh, is he then going to say, listen, we have to be more transparent, there have to be more accountability regarding the revenues that are flowing towards government from the mining industry? Um, I'm very doubtful of that. Uh, uh, are we going to get new inflows from, from, from other countries other than China, given that they have said, listen, they're not interested in, in, you know, in how things have happened? I doubt it. So he's a gatekeeper, yes, but they, we are not going to get increased inflows of, of revenue coming through the finance ministry. PT was the best. The worst that can happen is that uh, Chinamasa just maintained the status quo. Um, and Trevor? Yeah, I think, I think Shinamasa, um, um, one of the things that you need to look at is the uh, different shades of uh, eras between the GNU period and this new government. I think in the GNU period, we saw there was a reluctance on uh, the part of ZANU-PF to allow diamond revenues to trickle into Treasury because primarily that Treasury was run by Tendai BT, who was from um, the MDC parties. But now I think ZANU-PF, uh, because it now controls government, they have no way out. They just need to ensure that their diamond revenues are flowing into the Treasury um, to be able to sustain government and its operations. Therefore, Chinamasa is brought in more as a disciplinarian within the party. He's brought in as a hardliner in the party who's uh, willing to tow uh, the, 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 the revenue streams into line to bring in uh, money into Treasury. And I think this is the primary motivation for bringing Chinamasa in. And also, I think his loyalty levels to, 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 the, to President Mugabe himself also makes him lend that position. But I think it's a, it's a one-sided uh, consideration uh, because uh, over in terms of the issues of uh, the scope of management of the economy, like Vince has highlighted, those may be his weakness areas and also the issues of engaging outside of the broader framework of domestic quarters uh, uh, of the economy. So I think th that's the reasoning be be behind uh, bringing Chinamasa into the Minister of Finance. Mm, and David, uh, what about uh, Francis Nema in the Indigenization Ministry? Well, I was interested by that uh, because as I mentioned earlier, indigenization was the centerpiece of ZANU-PF's manifesto. Uh, they haven't put the strongest person in there. Francis Nema hardly ever speaks in cabinet. Uh, he, he is not one of the stronger people within the ZANU-PF uh, structures. Uh, and, and to that extent, I, I wonder whether this is an indication that ZANU-PF isn't really serious about its indigenization policy. I don't see him being as forthright and as determined as, say, Xavier Kasakueri was. Uh, and I think we'll, we will, this is probably an indication that indigenization is going to be put on the back burner, as it has to be if ZANU-PF are, are going to revitalize the economy. Do you agree, Vince, that um, by putting Francis Nema in that uh, ministry, ZANU-PF is now trying to turn down on the issue of indigenization? Um, I, okay, David's I, I got a, a different view to mine, which is okay. I think that indigenization is going to be critical, particularly to further enrich the ZANU PF people, and number two, to ensure that it is basically run by the president. So you don't put a strong person there, you put a weak person who gets instructions and does what he has to say. So that could be the other way of looking at it. I don't think it's going to put in the back burner because it will be there accepting that, listen, we've messed up. And we know their nature. It's not about doing what is right. It's more about egos and protecting egos. So I think it's going to continue unabated, uh, 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 and that's a scary bit. Do you agree? Can I just, sorry, can I sorry, sorry David, you're yeah, going? Go. Well, I, I hear what, is, uh, uh, what was said there. Um, I think that the problem that ZANU-PF will find in, in putting someone like Francis Nemo in that position is that uh, one of the reasons the uh, policy uh, has been 
in inverted commas, successful in the last four years is because of Xavier Kasakueri's character. Uh, he, he's a bombastic, forceful uh, person, and he has literally intimidated a lot of businesses to, to kowtow, to bow down. Uh, if, if you look at the law relating to indigenization, uh, for example, in the Constitution, it says very clearly, no one can be dispossessed of property that is non-rural land property without compensation. And, of course, the Indigenization Act itself um, has an aspirational clause. It's not mandatory. The 51% has never been mandatory. And it has taken the force and the vigor of someone like Xavier Kasakoueri to literally intimidate companies into complying. And even if Francis Nemer gets instruction, at the end of the day, when you know, the rubber hits the road, this interaction uh, with companies, I don't see him having the same force and powers of intimidation as someone like Xavier Kasakoueri had. Mm. So, yeah. Trevor, what do you make of that? Why would Mugabe put uh, someone uh, that David Coulthard has uh, described as a bombastic, aggressive character like Xavier Kasakoueri in the Environment and Water Ministry? Is that the right place for him? What is that about? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, 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 it's about, uh, uh, you know, Xavier Kasakoueri is, is, uh, is one of the youngest in that lineup um, mm. of, of, of ministers. And uh, I'm sure Mugabe had to sacrifice uh, someone in the back line uh, because you also see that there are a lot of uh, uh, old host loyal loyalty uh, 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 personnel that have come back, people like Zigamaima, Vaire, um, and, uh, and I'm sure there are the, the a couple more, uh, Jonathan Moyo. Mm. So uh, Kasukuere is, is, is part of the fuel in, in, in ZANU-PF. So, but at the same time, um, he has been um, uh, uh, sidelined um, to be able to allow Mugabe to have more leverage and more leeway to bring in some of uh, the, the old horses. But at the same time, he has also not been discarded completely out of, 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 the, of that cabinet. So it is seen as sort of like a, a, a managing, uh, obviously, Kasukuere's youth, um, um, but also at the same time preserving him uh, within a framework where he can still be useful in the party. But uh, much as many people think that um, this might be a demotion uh, for Seva Kasukuere, let's not forget that the water situation in Zimbabwe is critical and uh, isn't this an important ministry? Yeah, no, it's an important ministry but mm. uh, if you look at uh, how the ministries operate, for example, uh, the minister that Sevier Kasukwere has been given uh, is a minister that controls the water sources. Um, he's not responsible for, 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 for the outline of, in, I mean, the the, 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 the uh, infrastructural uh, aspect right up to, to, to the user. You realize that there is a, we, we, we've got uh, the, 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 the Zinua project, but you also have got uh, municipalities that are responsible for the direct delivery of that water into, 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 into the citizens' uh, uh, houses. So you'd find that he's not going to be a very critical component in terms of resolving the distribution of water uh, at, at supply, but he's going to be, he's, he's going to be more focused on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, I mean, on the supply side rather than the delivery side. So, but at the same time, I think the ministry that has been given is, is deals with the environment. It also deals with water. It deals with climate change, with, which I think uh, are very topical issues at the global level. They are very topical issues at the regional level. SADC, like for example, is actually concerned on issues of climate change and issues of environmental uh, degradation. Um, so it, it, let's not uh, write away that particular ministry. It's got its, its, its importance. Only that I think the issue for Zimbabweans now is the priority is to see bread and butter issues on the table. But I think the minister that has been given is not as useless as other people are saying. It's mm. still crit a critical component of government. Mm. And David, let's talk a bit about the new kids on the block. And uh, perhaps we can start with the new old um, kid, uh, Jonathan Moyo, who's come back. What was your reaction when you heard that uh, Jonathan Moyo is going to be the new information minister? Well, before I do that, can I just briefly go back to the Kasakuri issue uh, and respond there's a difference between important ministries and powerful ministries. Water is important. Education is important. But both are very weak ministries from a political perspective. Uh, you, you, you can't get <laughs> much patronage out of them. Uh, you don't wield much political power. And there's no doubt that indigenization was a much more powerful political ministry than, than water. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me come to, to Jonathan Moyer. I, I'm not surprised by this. It's similar to 
Patrick Tinamasta, he's being rewarded. Patrick Tinamasta, I've no doubt, was given finance because of his Machiavellian side uh, in manipulating the electoral process, in basically delivering the election to Mugabe. Patrick Tinamasta played a key role in that. And I think that Jonathan Moyer played a similar role. I'm told that Jonathan Moyer drafted the manifesto and and no doubt had a huge input in terms of the message of Zanetieff. Robert Mugabe would have known that, and, and this is now the reward uh, that, that Jonathan Moyer has received. Of course, it, it's very worrying, given his past record, uh, regarding how other aspects of the Constitution are, are going to be uh, respected. As, as you know, there's a new Constitution, uh, Section 61, uh, has very detailed provisions regarding freedom of expression and the freedom of the media. Uh, subsection 4 of that says all state-owned media of communication must be impartial, must afford fair opportunity. Uh, it's hard to imagine that uh, someone like Jonathan Moyer is, is going to uh, respect those provisions of the Constitution. Hmm. Vince, what do you make of uh, Jonathan Moyer's appointment? Yeah, uh, Valerie, I, I agree with David. They back to the future. You know, uh, he was the, the you know the, the man that brought brought in a repressive media, and going forward, you know, we I, I'm, we are, I don't think we have to see you know some of those reforms being enthusiastically put into place. What I just wonder is that you know it's so sad in the 21st century we still have a minister of information. You know, given that information should actually be open out there if we were to have create a modern democracy. But again, it shows, you know, that ZANU PF is still way, way behind regarding the way they view the world. Mm. Uh, uh, Trevor, bef uh, before, before you, 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 okay, you can, uh, you, okay. you can give us no, your, uh, your, your thoughts and yes. then I'll ask you a question okay. about. No, ju just on, on the issue of Jonathan Moyo. Mm. I, th I think also you, you need to look at uh, the variables that ZANU PF is uh, uh, caught up with. Uh, number one, it's uh, an issue I'm, I'm sure you've heard from uh, President Mugabe talking about the issue of sanctions. Um, uh, you've heard about uh, the issue of international, Zimbabwe's international uh, uh, relations with the other communities. Um, therefore, by bringing Jonathan Moyo into this play, uh, uh, what, what, what President Mugabe is indicating is that uh, he needs to continue to play the propaganda machinery uh, as, as strong as possible. Uh, but at the same time as well, Jonathan Moyo, uh, given his nature, is not somebody who's confinable. You can't confine find him into a, into a, into a space. Uh, he always goes beyond. You remember in the cabinet of the 2000s when he was still involved, he used to be like the, the de facto prime minister. I mean, he was involved everywhere. And uh, m m m m m President Mugabe brings him into this frame, uh, not just for the information ministry, but also to craft that particular message that cuts across government and is head outside uh, the country and inside the country. So you, 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 you're not going to see him just play that role of uh, uh, dealing with ZBC, ZTV and the media houses. You are going to see him uh, cutting across the public relations issues and the uh, information communication issues across all ministries and across government departments. Mm, and it's not just um, journalists from the private media who are worried, even journalists from the public, from the state-controlled media yes, I was, are I was, worried about it. Yes, I was actually joking with some of them and I was saying expect an, another editor in your newsrooms at 12 midnight every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, Violet, yes, yes, David. Can, can I just tip it one other aspect? Mm. You know, if Zanu PF are going to turn around the economy, it, it is critically important that they get Western capital uh, to return to Zimbabwe, that they restore their relationship uh, with Western government. You know, aside from all the rhetoric of looking east and all of that, the fact is that China has uh, not invested much into, into Zimbabwe. It's invested in extractive industries, but not in tourism, not in manufacturing. And the message that is portrayed is critically important. And I find this appointment curious because given the vitriolic nature of, of Jonathan Moyer, uh, he is the one person who will be guaranteed uh, to, to get the backup of, of the nations we need to restore relations with. Perhaps this is going to be his uh, um, turn or time to redeem himself. Do you see him doing that? Well, I've known Jonathan Moyer for a long, long time, um, you know, over two decades. And in terms of his 
professional progression, I've seen someone who's become more extreme. Uh, that's the trajectory that, that he's been pursuing. So it will be remarkable if there is a turnaround. And I hope for the, the sake of the nation that there is that turnaround. Uh, but if he continues the trajectory, certainly he's been on for the last 10, 15 years. That's unlikely. And uh, still, uh, David, as the former education minister, what do you make of the two appointments um, uh, to do with education, starting with uh, Andrew Langer? Um, do you think that is a, a good appointment? Are you happy about uh, his appointment? Well, Andrew Langer is not education. He's been appointed. Oh, sports, sports, arts, arts and, and culture. culture. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, Andrew Langer is notorious in Matabele land. He's, he's not, uh, let me put it this way, particularly associated with the arts and culture. Um, he perhaps might do quite well in sport when it comes to, to wrestling and shooting, um, but he, he doesn't have a particularly good knowledge of the Queensbury <laughs> rule. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, regarding Lazarus de Cora, who's been appointed primary and secondary education, I'm more positive about his appointment. As you know, he was my deputy. I worked very well with him. There's no doubt that he is what I term a, a Majuru pragmatist. Um, he was very supportive of me in the last four years. Um, he agreed with our policies. Uh, and, and so I, I think that of all the people that uh, Robert Mugabe had to choose from, that, that was a good choice. And I hope that uh, he, he will continue what we've been doing together over the last four years. His immediate problem is to confront the issue of whether the Education Transition Fund is legal or not. As you know, in the Donatief Manifesto, they said the Education Transition Fund was illegal and that I had acted illegally. Uh, that's going to be his first decision. He has to decide uh, whether it's legal or not, because, of course, if it's illegal, then they won't want to take the $160 million, which is in the fund, and they'll have to look for that money elsewhere, which uh, I think might be difficult. Do you think it's a good move, um, removing education from uh, the Sports and uh, Culture Ministry? Well, I think if you've got the, the luxury of lots of money, it's a good move, because there's no doubt that sports, arts, and culture tends to get drowned by education. But uh, I uh, am against large cabinets. Um, I, I think that this country cannot afford a cabinet of this size. Uh, and what we should rather have been looking to do is consolidate ministries rather than expand them. I think that uh, the, the right ministry would be one ministry of education involving both primary, secondary, and tertiary. And I think that in that ministry as well should be sport, arts, and culture. There was a logic including sport, arts, and culture. And I think that there should have been one minister for all of those with perhaps two or three deputy uh, ministers. This way you create an entirely new ministry of sport, arts, and culture. I question where the money is going to come from. Uh, you need to get another Mercedes-Benz, another four-wheel drive, a permanent secretary, all the paraphernalia, and uh, we didn't have any money for sport, arts, and culture in the existing budget. I don't see where that money is going to come from to to fund this this extra expenditure. So, mm. in conclusion, it's it's a luxury if you're a, a fabulously wealthy country, but it's a luxury we can't afford at present. And Vince, do you think it's also a luxury having the Ministry of Energy and Power Development? And I think the new minister there is uh, Zikamai um, Mavaire. Yeah, I mean, going forward, violent energy is a critical issue, uh, given you know where we are and the fact that as a country we have not used, uh, we have not focused really on renewable energy, so we can reduce, you know, the 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 the, the problem with how it eats into disposable income. You know, so it's a, it's a very critical, critical uh, sector going forward in the world and obviously, you know, here too. And I actually expected more of, a, of an engineer, more of a person who, you know, who has the technical capability, but also, you know, will tend to look into the future. So it's a critical, it is a critical, and I think it must be separate. 
it's just disappointing to see what, what is the Mama Vaire going to tell us about carbon credits and, you know, the issue of uh, energy renewal in that. Mm. Yeah. Trailer. Yeah, I just want to come in there as well, I mean, uh, in, in terms of uh, what Vince has been talking about, in terms of the Minister of um, Energy. Uh, I think if you speak to, to Zimbabweans, uh, one of the key concerns across the board is uh, the issue of uh, the, 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 the power, I mean, uh, the shortage of power. Uh, and uh, like Vince says, uh, the, 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 the appointment of um, Mavaira, I think, is more political than it is to solve a technical issue. And this is where the challenge of this cabinet is, where you see politics overriding the issues or the challenges that are, are at the table. Um, Zikamai Mavaire, you remember that at one point he was one of the f first, um, I think after Edison's Robo or, or so, to publicly speak about uh, President Mugabe's uh, retirement and asking for it uh, for Parliament to discuss that kind of a, of an issue, and uh, you also see that over time he went into some uh, he was taken into uh, disciplinary uh, hearings and uh, was suspended at one point in time, uh, and then was reinstated, uh, and now is back and f not just back but back in cabinet. I think it's also a message in ZANU PF that uh, uh, if you have struck the wrong chord in the past, uh, you can be rewarded should you return to be loyal. Mm. And like Jonathan, like, like Jonathan Moy as well. Mm. So this, you find, uh, I think what uh, Zanopiev has done is sacrifice the technical issues of the country for the sake of sending both local, I mean, both internal, domestic, and foreign political messages. And I think what we are doing is we are playing politics with uh, issues of nation building. Mm. And earlier on, you talked a bit about uh, Mike Bima, and you mentioned that is related to uh, Grace Mugabe. But uh, in terms of his ministry, the industry ministry, do you think he's the right person for the job? What's, what's his background? Yeah, I, th I think he is. I think he is. Uh, Mike B, my uh, background is, um, if I'm not wrong, is a, is a, a human rights, I mean, human, human resources uh, practitioner. Um, you remember at one point in time he was also the chair of the ASIM board um, and uh, he has also been involved in private business. Um, I think just given his background, um, uh, I think for, for, for me, I think he's a, he's a, he's a good choice for, 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 for that job. Um, he was in a deputy uh, position uh, in the previous cabinet and um, if there were one or two things to learn, then I, sh I think he, you'll have ample time to, to apply that uh, this time around. I think for him, I have no problems with him as an individual given his experience and the kind of person he is. Mm. And David, one of our uh, critical service industries is, or service uh, sector is uh, the health uh, sector. And it seems like David Parinyatwa has come back. But just uh, listening to some of the feedback we're getting from our viewers, it's like people are not happy with this appointment and they blame him for the, you know, the breakdown that we've seen in the, in the health uh, uh, industry. So what do you say about that in the health sector? Well, once again, uh, President Mugabe had a, a confined pool from which to choose. He didn't have many doctors. Uh, I see a lot of these appointments being done, as my colleagues have said this afternoon, uh, not necessarily choosing the best person for the job, but uh, because of the need to, to balance interests, especially within Zane PF. And I think one thing that we haven't really discussed in detail this afternoon is just how this cabinet, in my view, is dominated by people um, who are aligned to Joyce uh, Mojuru. It, it, it just uh, leaps out at me. Uh, according to my calculation, there, there are 13 um, Mojuru loyalists, and I, I suspect that David Parinyatwa is, is probably one of those. Um, and, and so we see, Did you we say see 13 or 30? 13. Okay. 13, at mm -hmm. least half, are, are very obviously Mujuru uh, loyalists. And, um, you know, coming, coming back to the, the, the issue of uh, Mavaire um, and energy and power development, he, he clearly is a Mujuru uh, pragmatist. Uh, and... and That'll be one of the key reasons why he is, is in this cabinet. I, you know, as I look at this, I see a cabinet that's been chosen by uh, Vice President Mujuru mm. in consultation with President Mugabe. They couldn't get rid of Emerson Minangagwa because he's too senior in the party. It, it would have been scandalous if he was left out. Uh, it would have been sure evidence of a split. But 
they've done it in a very subtle way. They've separated him from the, the generals, given given him uh, you know an important ministry, but it's from a political perspective not that that powerful. But he's there, so he can't complain. But you, you, can you not say the other half um, represents the Mnangagwa faction? No. Like, wouldn't you say Jonathan Moyo is from the Mnangagwa well, faction? I've, I think that Jonathan Moore probably is in, in that faction, certainly historically, if you go back to Chilocho and, and you know, that, that whole saga, he's in that. And they couldn't ignore that, uh, that faction completely to, to achieve harmony. But I see three uh, different elements in, in this cabinet. I see the dominant ele element being those who owe their allegiances to, to Joyce Majuru. I see a batch of people who are sort of in the, in the middle. It's not clear where their allegiances lie, uh, and they probably are, uh, lie with President Mugabe, mm -hmm. not with Manangagwa. So you've got people like Walter Chidakwa, uh, Joseph Made, um, Sidney Sikeramai, all of those people. I wouldn't necessarily put in the Majuru camp, but they, they owe their allegiances to, to Mugabe. And then there's a relatively small group who are close to Manangagwa, um, but they they constitute a tiny minority. I don't uh, I I don't estimate them to be more than six in in this in this camp. Where yeah. does Chombo stand, Ignatius Chombo? I think, you know, Chombo is definitely someone who's loyal to to Mugabe. He, he's from Zimba. You wouldn't say <coughs> that he's necessarily someone aligned to to Joyce Majuru. I, I would put him in the second camp. Yeah. Mm. Yep. I, I would also just want to come in there to 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 um, um, t uh, uh, support what Dave, Dave Dave is talking about. Uh, I think you also see a layer, uh, Violet, in that uh, they you can obviously divide this cabinet maybe into Mujuru or Mnangagwa, but ultimately uh, the the issue is uh, what is the primacy loyalty. Uh, to Mugabe in this to in, in in this cabinet. So you realize there are people like Jonathan Moyo, people like uh, Kembo Mohadi, people like uh, Webster Shamu, people like Ignatius Chombo, people like Shinamasa, who you can throw either to Mnangagwa or to Mujuru. But ultimately, their number one um, uh, sort of like allegiance is to Mugabe, Mugabe himself. Mm. To an extent that if the if 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 if, if push comes to shove, Mugabe, using his overriding loyalties in the party can actually shift uh, some of these people from where they are into a position where he wants them to be, to support uh, whoever he wants to be the, 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 the successor. Mm. So you can actually see that, that kind of a balance. So beyond the Mujuru Munangagwa, there's also the very big factor of loyalty to Mugabe himself, should he want to, call, uh, to, 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 to make a call on success. And those people who are loyal uh, to Mugabe, Vince, would you say are the people, the big winners in this uh, new cabinet because they retained their positions like uh, Ignatius Chombo, who's still the local government minister, Walter Mzembi, Tourism, uh, Kembo Mahadi, Home, um, home Affairs, and um, Joseph Made, uh, Agriculture. Would, would you agree that uh, the, that's the faction that would be said to be loyal to Mugabe and that's why they retained their positions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, obviously, Violet, I think David, and, you know, put it very well in that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, our politics has really never been about delivery, it's about loyalties and you know, saying who's on which side. So I agree with that with that statement, Violet. Mm. And uh, David, on land, uh, that's a bit of a, a weird, uh, um, two weird ministries that we have because one of them has two deputies, and I, I don't know if it's the agriculture ministry or the land um, uh, ministry. And also, what do you make of um, Mombeshora's, I forgot his first name, Douglas Mombeshora's uh, appointment as the new lands minister? Well, I don't know Douglas uh, Mombeshora that, that well. He, he um, strikes me as being a, a reasonable person. Uh, he's not given to you know, radical, irrational statements. So uh, to, to that extent, I, I think that um, he, he's the logical successor to Herbert Morewa, who was a, a, a man, you know, cut in a similar mold. I, once again, I think that this is an indication that uh, the land issue is not going to be a, a primary focus of, 
of ZANU. They haven't put a very aggressive person in there. I think it's an indication, like NEMA and indigenization, that ZANU recognise they've, they've got to get the country productive again if they are to meet all their election promises. So, I, you know, I think he's a, um, a you know, reasonably safe pair, pair of hands. Uh, coming to your fundamental point about the difference between lands and agriculture, it's agriculture that's got the two uh, deputy ministers, um, not not land. Lands has Tendai Stavano as deputy minister of land, uh, and I think that there are two deputy ministers of agriculture mm. uh, to, to, to help um, Joseph yeah. Made. Yeah. Do we and need uh, two deputy yeah. ministers? Yeah, I, th I think it reflects what uh, what David has been talking about. That uh, you see, the issue of uh, land redistribution is nearly uh, a, 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 a not a very topical issue now because I think a lot of the land is now in the hands of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of 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 Zimbabweans. I think the issue that the pressure that government is facing now from those that are on the land is the issue of support for productivity. Uh, so, which is why you find that President Mugabe is swayed from uh, strengthening the issue of land, which deals with distrib redistribution, to bringing in two um, uh, deputy ministers under agriculture, which looks at issues of support uh, and the productivity, which is a big demand from those that are on the land at the moment. Mm. And Vince, what did you make of this new ministry? I think it's called the the Ministry of State for Vocational Training and Psychomotor Activities. What on earth is that? Nothing. <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> Maybe David can come in here. <laughs> what is it, David? Do you know anything about that? Is <laughs> well, I, I was absolutely intrigued by that. As you know, the Nzaramasanga Commission in 1999 said that uh, our education sector was too academically orientated that there needed to be more vocational education. Uh, in my discussions with President Mugabe in the last four years, I know it's a passion of his. He understands that. I think he was probably just as frustrated as, as I was that so little had been done to implement that aspect. And I suppose this is his effort at trying to, to address that. Uh, I, I think it's in the wrong place. I don't think it deserves uh, a An entire on ministry. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it needs to be slotted in, in, in this wider education ministry. It's clearly something that affects primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, education. That's the proper place. Is yep, that what yep. Zimbabwe needs, Trevor? Yep, yep. Brain and physical coordination. <clears throat> Look, right I, now. I, I think it's. A, I think it's a critical ministry. I mean, it's, it's a critical component. My, my, mm. my argument is, it must not have been a ministry. It could have been a department, but creating a ministry for it uh, is, is is a bit of an overshoot. Uh, an overshoot. But uh, however, the importance of this of of, of this department as as it should be is that uh, uh, you realize that across the world there's been studies done, whether we agree or not, that a lot of uh, the children that we then push into higher education, uh, university, and so forth, if they don't have a well-developed, uh, what they call psycho-motor uh, balance in terms of uh, uh, their, 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 their physical education, in terms of their sight, in terms of uh, their senses, in terms of just their balance uh, is in, in the body, it then affects their learning capabilities uh, later on in life. So I think it's, it's, it's an attempt to address those kind of important issues. But I think, again, the question is, do we address it in this way uh, by creating a ministry separate uh, for, mm. for, for, for that kind of a need? Mm. And we, we're running out of uh, time, but I just have uh, just one more question for, for each of you. And starting with Vince, uh, many people we're talking to are saying that in terms of the way forward, the MDC should also announce its uh, shadow cabinet and that they should have done this uh, by now. Uh, do you agree with this? And what would it help? Yeah, okay. You know, I think, you know, one of the problems with opposition politics in Zimbabwe is it has never been clinical. We have landed to, we have, it has ended in, within parliament. And then everything else that happens in the ministry does not get a serious critique, uh, except from analysts who might be outside there. So you need a constant critique to make these guys uncomfortable of what they're doing. And I think a shadow cabinet would serve that purpose. It will also maybe demonstrate to us the kind of talent that could be around. So there could be an emotional and psychological benefit to having that uh, towards change. So I would support it, but the issue of Violet is that who will pay for it? It's a full-time job. Who is going to pay for that? And I think that is going to become the main issue. David? 
Oh, I agree. I think that uh, we need a shadow cabinet. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons why we haven't got one is because both MDCs are, are still uh, reeling from the extent of the, of the fraud. But we, we need to realize the fraud is there. They are in government. Mm -hmm. That's the de facto mm -hmm. situation. The SADC and the AU accepted. No one's going to overturn that. We've got five years of this, and now we need to make them accountable. And the mm -hmm. best way of making this government accountable is through Parliament, uh, and, and you need people appointed to shadow particular ministries. Final word, Trevor. Yeah, I, I think I'm taken aback by the post-election strategy by, by the MDC uh, party. Um, for example, the issue of shadow cabinet that you mentioned, I think the MDC uh, T, for example, was the most vocal about uh, why is President Mugabe uh, delaying to announce uh, cabinet, when yet that delay could have been an opportunity for them to start to have uh, their own shadow cabinet in place, start to already propound and propose uh, policies, start to raise critical issues of national development. And then when Mugabe would have then announced his own cabinet, it. it would have been shadowed by what the MDC already have presented. But again, I, I don't see a clear, methodical, strategic post-election strategies by the MDC. Uh, another issue, just before we go, is that uh, they continue to harp about uh, a lost election. I hear there are rallies that are lined up to, to celebrate what they call a, 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 a stolen victory. Mm. I think th they are losing the relevance of where Zimbabwe is and what the issues are at people's heart. People are looking at fertilizer, they are looking at a seed for this agricultural system, they are looking at bread and butter issues, and they are looking for an opposition that is able to squeeze ZANU-PF into a corner to perform. And the MDC apparently have not shown that at the moment. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it have made more sense for them to wait for the announcement of the new cabinet so that they, they know what is happening? Surely they wouldn't have known that Mugabe would have a ministry of psychomotor activities. So w w isn't it better for them? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been better for them to wait and see what's there and then choose the shadow cabinet? No, I think the needs of Zimbabwe at the moment are known. If the MDC is strategic enough, they would know what are the priority needs in Zimbabwe. They would have appointed a shadow cabinet that reflects the real needs in this, in this country. When President Mugabe would have then come in with a cabinet that does not sh show that, that would have given a positive to the MDC. Okay, we have come to the end of our program. First talk with Violet Gonda, and I'd like to thank my guests, Trevor Maisiri from the ICG, uh, former Education Minister David Coulthard and Economist Vince Musewe. Thank you very much for participating on the program. Thank you, Violet. Thanks, Violet. Violet. Cheers, Trevor. Thank Cheers, David. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, our viewers, for watching First Talk with Violet Gonda. Good night.